two and hey everybody this is tim anderson programming coordinator for the florida film festival and welcome to our six times real documentary shorts program q a uh, we are super excited we hope you really loved these films don't forget to vote for them they're up for the audience award for best short and uh, i'd like to take a second introduce some of the filmmakers that we've got in this program um, I'll start with Noah and Louie. Hey, guys, how's it going? Hey, Tim, how's it going? <laughs> Good. How's it going, Tim? We're coming to you live from the LaGuardia Airport on our way to you at the Florida Film Fest. <laughs> and what was your movie? Uh, Shots in the Dark with David Godless. And we're going to say a little bit about that? Um, it's, it's uh, a black and white punk odyssey through uh, the doors, uh, told through the doors and soul and body and walls and smoke filled rooms and heroin den basement of CBGB's New York City in the night, late 70s. On the Bowery. On the Bowery. Don't forget the Bowery. You guys left out the bathroom, man. Oh, we're the uh, <laughs> shit, sh shit piled bathroom. <laughs> Sorry, are you going to bleep it? Are you going to bleep it? No. Oh, oh. <laughs> Um, no, I we're not fucking bleeping this. <laughs> it's gonna be a long Q and A, guys. Um, Jimmy, welcome. Hey, what's up, Tim? Good um, man. Yeah, so I'm I'm not coming. I I was in Florida earlier <laughs> in the year. Sorry, I I love it. I wish it's I was sorry. at the um, Miss you, man. We do too. <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, so my movie's a broken house. Um, it's uh, it's about Muhammad Hafez, who is a Syrian architect who basically got trapped in the United States in an earlier iteration of the Muslim ban when he like came to the U.S. Yeah. for architecture school and then wasn't allowed to return home. So it's the way in which like he began to, you know, I think manifest his uh, yeah. homesickness through his art. So uh, yeah, that's that's that. awesome. Yeah, we got I got a lot of questions on that. I'm sure everybody else does too. Um, well, let me jump over to Ben. Concerto is a conversation. Uh, I'm I'm spoiling it. I'm telling people what your movie is. Hey, Ben. Hey, Tim, how are you? Good, good. Well, I said what your movie is, so tell us a little bit about what your movie is about. Yeah, so I'm Ben. I'm the co-director of A Concerto is a Conversation. And um, Chris, who un unfortunately had to send his regrets, couldn't be here today. Um, it, it follows Chris, and who's a, a composer, and his grandfather, who actually was born and grew up in a small town called Bascom, Florida and his story of hitchhiking across the United States and sort of serendipitously landing in Los Angeles and the obstacles he faced in establishing himself in Los Angeles and thus sort of building the base for Chris um, to have a career as a composer. And then the sort of contemporary storyline is Chris writing this concerto for its premiere at the Walt Disney Concert Hall. So it's about music, it's about family, it's about race in America. Um, and uh, yeah, it's about 13 minutes long. Awesome. It's, <laughs> it's an incredible film. It's absolutely spectacular. So, um, Alex, Caitlin, hi, welcome. Hello, hey. how's it going? God, hey. we love this short so much. <laughs> Thank you. Thank so, you. Um, Alex, I'm the co-director and DP. I'm Caitlin Swalje, co-director and writer. So our film is Snowy. It's about my uncle's pet turtle that's been living in his basement <laughs> for over 25 years. Uh, and it's the story of Caitlin and I trying to make Snowy's life better. We, we go to England, we talk to an animal psychic, um, we go on kind of a little journey to sort of get inside his head. Yeah. It's it's magic. It's really Thank magical. you. And Emily, um, last but not least, but you also close out this program because we had no idea how to put a film after yours. So it's powerful stuff, so. Um, hi, yeah, I'm excited to be here. Thanks for including the film in the lineup. Um, Mine is not 13 minutes, it's uh, very long at 40. Um, and it's called Meltdown in Dixie and is about um, a battle over a Confederate flag flying outside of an ice cream shop in my hometown in um, South Carolina. And is kind of, you know, in microcosm looking at an issue that our whole country is, is dealing with right now. Awesome, well, I really appreciate you joining us. Um, Charles Pegg, I would open the floor to you with some questions you might have for these filmmakers. Well, I'm willing to start. Go, Go for, for it. it. Uh, uh, and, and, and since this is being projected in front of the audience, assuming so, I'm going to try to represent the things that might be in their minds, having yeah. just witnessed these films. And one thing is a lot of people enter, start watching documentaries with the notion that they're going to experience something like journalism, 
Whereas I suspect we all agree that what you guys are doing is constructed artwork. And it's not, even though your standards are certainly to be telling truthful stories, that it is a constructed narrative to make a point that represents what you were feeling at the time. It's as much about the creator as it is about the subject matter versus journalism where the creator disappears and it's just about the subject matter. So I, I guess I'd like to just throw a question, broad question out. Maybe, maybe the best place for this to go might be like snowy. <laughs> You know, what did you start out thinking you were making and how much did it change and you change in the process of making it? So, uh, great question. I, I, we completely agree. I mean, especially with this film, we're in the story. We're the ones pushing the story forward. We're the ones really kind of twisting my uncle's yeah, arm. And the heart of it is it's an intervention. Yeah. <laughs> um, so in the beginning, uh, you know, I had been going down to my uncle's house every year for, you know, my whole life. And so that was sort of the seed of the movie. Um, how that would translate into a film was a whole nother story, which we actually really struggled with. And we weren't quite sure how to end it. At first, we're like, maybe we can force my uncle to give the turtle away. We needed some kind of arc. Uh, it wasn't until Caitlin came in, more of a journalism background, actually, that was able to kind of craft the film as you see it. And then... You know, she can talk more on that. Yeah, I mean, trying to kind of illuminate the inner world of a turtle isn't so easy. Um, it's a pretty expressionless <laughs> animal as far as house pets go. Um, and we knew we couldn't kind of just stare at it and wait for something to happen because not much was ever going to happen. <laughs> um, so through kind of a chain of people, I got in touch with this woman named Dr. Anna Wilkinson um, who runs something called the Cold-Blooded Cognition Lab um, in England. And I think Alex was sitting on the deck right after I got off the phone with her. Um, I was like, Alex, you want to go to England? And he said, hell yeah. So I think that sort of opened up the story for it to just not have us, you know, be sitting in the basement waiting for the turtle to tell us something. Um, yeah. We were kind of able to get more at yeah. what was going on. And our heroes, uh, I think I can speak for Caitlin on this, you know, American Movie is a documentary okay. we love. You know, we sure. grew up watching The Office. We grew up watching Arrested Development. So we were kind of looking for things in life that, affirmed this vision of the world that yeah. we that we want to have where it's a, a magical place um yeah and there was i mean kind of to alex's point we're very attracted to this sort of earnest maybe i don't want to say pitiful but there's something don't talk about my uncle like that. <laughs> <laughs> well let's take with earnest okay. this earnest vulnerable character um from you know the office american movie they sort of they um exemplify this too so i think yeah that's sort yeah. of where that translated I love the I love the brothers when they said, uh, one of them was like uh, so be honest were you ever even considering taking it to college he's like, and he's no. like no of course not and like that's that was the like, they were like there you go that's all you need to know about the turtle <laughs> love it. speaking I think, of earnest and vulnerable yeah. I want to I want to ask Jimmy a question about his subject matter and you have a very earnest and very vulnerable character at the center of a broken house. And you, I think, were fairly courageous in approach, at least in the beginning of the film, it was almost abstraction. I'm watching it, I'm going, I'm not sure I know what this is about. And I deliberately try not to do research before I watch this. Not sure what this is about. And what's this? And there's like this weird store kinda or junk, and then this guy, and then these incredible things grow out of his vision. But the vision is really not even about what he's creating, but what is being created inside of him. And I thought it was so courageous. And were you ever concerned he was going to fall apart on you in that process? Huh. Um, I don't know if that's, you know, I guess the thing is that I don't know if that would be a concern, right? Which is mm -hmm. that it's um, in documentary, at least the way that I approach it, it's like I'm trying to create a space, you know, and I'm trying to create a space where you know, he can express himself artistically, but I'm also trying to create a space where he can be vulnerable. And so like, if he were to fall apart on me, I think that the, we would have had a space for that to be okay. And, yeah. and I think that the way that you do that, at least the way that I do that is by also being vulnerable. And it's <laughs> like, I, I sometimes think that, I mean, courageous is an interesting word. It's like, I do think that sometimes a movie, particularly a nonfiction movie, can only go as deep as the filmmaker is willing to go. And so I, 
I want to make sure that whatever part of him wants to show up is welcome and I'm not going to judge it because, because that is human, you know, yeah. that's, that's, I don't want, like, I, 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 you know, we all, I like, I was watching a lot of like transcendental cinema and I had like a Paul Schrader, like mentality going into filming this, but like all that stuff kind of goes away a little bit when you're with your subject, allowing them to be themselves. And I just wanted to give him space. I wanted him to feel safe with me. That was, and I think that it pays off cinematically, hopefully. Yeah. Jimmy, <laughs> as long as, Sorry, go ahead, go ahead. I was going to say, I, I was, you know, I'm, watching this film like this and at the end I just puddled out I mean it was such a sweet and authentic emotional experience to to travel through that guy's circumstances with him and see how he uh you know articulated it in his art as well as in his life so thank thank you so much I'm going to be quiet for a minute now Matthew oh, that's yeah. okay hey, yeah, Jimmy I didn't, as, long, as long as we're talking about your film I just wanted to ask uh, a couple of things. One is, can you talk about your original title of the film before Broken House? It was called, I think, an Arabic word called Harayath. I don't know if I'm pronouncing it correctly. So I'm wondering if you could talk about the meaning of that title to the content of the film. And also, have you kept in touch with Mohammed? And is where is he at with his situation? Is like his dad still living with him in the U.S. and his mom still living in Syria or the Middle East or where, where are we great. at with the story? Not great. Yeah, it's, um, yeah, so I originally entitled it Hariyath, actually a Welsh word, but it was like a word that Muhammad taught me about. One of his artworks is called Hariyath. Okay. And what it means is um, it's a homesickness for a place that no longer exists or maybe never ever existed. And so I really liked that idea where it's like in the process of remembering, you're changing your memories. That's just truth. Mm -hmm. And so it's like a physical fact. And so I liked the idea that like the Damascus that he was creating was honestly- Like a fantasy, yeah. It was a fantasy, yeah. And, yeah. He, was, and he was living in a fantasy. And I was hoping mm -hmm. that the movie would kind of, you know, have a sort of romantic notion of what, you know, it brings you on a nostalgic journey, right? So it starts a little abstractly to Peg's point. It's like, you know, this is, we're in a nostalgic fantasy. And then the reality is like, what's actually happening between him and his mother in that hotel room, which is yeah. quite, just not great. It's like, yeah, it's heartbreaking. Sad. So, but I think on an optimistic note, Muhammad actually quit his architecture firm uh, and in quarantine decided that he wanted to open a Syrian coffee shop in New Haven, <laughs> Connecticut. That's so if great. anyone's like visiting Yale for whatever reason, uh, you, can, you can go have like him pour coffee and have like traditional Syrian pastries and biscuits because at the end of the day, all he really wants to do is build bridges between communities and hang out with people and tell stories. And that's what he figured he could do in a coffee shop. So yeah. I love him. He's awesome. Man, that's I am good. on my way. Go. <laughs> It's good. I mean, it's like rocket fuel though. Like Muhammad's coffee is like, whoa. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Well, I want to ask a question to Noah and Louie real quick. Um, and then we'll jump back in. Hi, Tim. You. Hi, guys. I'm just afraid you're going to have to board. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> Wait, let's is... get a quick little pan around. We are, uh, this isn't a goofy um, green screen <laughs> Zoom background. <laughs> and uh, it's, it's handy. We have these microphones, you know, who's talking. Yep. So yeah. I do want to, so the quick question I want to ask is, um, this is the third film of yours that we've played at the festival. Um, and you've developed this phenomenally interesting kind of pastiche style of using audio verite of true stories being told by your subjects, and then illustrating them in a way um, that's, you know, we see sometimes a little bit of animation inside of uh, Instead of documentary, but you guys really kind of take it to the next level, and so much so that we oh, felt thank that you. this was the first film of yours. Obviously, we're playing as a documentary competition. Previously, we have played you as animation. I think that's due to David's story being so strong. So I like to know about you know tracking David down, but also um, the decision to kind of do a little less animation in this one. Um, you know, comparative to your usual yeah. kind of model slash sketch, you know, more photography and archive. Yeah. So a lot of uh, the conversations Noah and I had early on was like, we can't put our fingerprints over the, like all over his art because yeah. it was it was sensitive because we're already dealing with 
a body of work that like is so amazing and profound and what it, all the it's, great it's already assembled i mean he he has a book uh for, with all those pictures yeah and so i like to say our you film, guys should go buy it our I, film is an adaptation of his photo book essentially okay. and it's, yeah yeah so we had to work from that and that was a little restrictive but we didn't want to yeah we didn't want to add anything to his pics or anything <laughs> and we did but anyone like <laughs> respectfully like puking and on stage or something like so i don't know just... yeah we didn't like want to heighten his work we wanted his work to stand alone well but you asked tim asked you how you met him yeah how'd you meet <laughs> david uh okay i met him uh i used to work at the lincoln center at the film society there and he is like ever since cbgb shut down he has yeah. like found a new home in cinema because he oh. thinks that like these young filmmakers who are coming up in the fil film industry are like more akin to the punk rock uh, uh rock stars of the 70s yeah which is really interesting uh like he says like any group of artists who is like carry the torch of the punk attitude is young filmmakers so he loves young filmmakers and um I would I had followed Lincoln Center on Instagram for a long time and they always tag him in posts that he so he's photographs like all sorts of film events he can and he's got the just iconic white plume of hair and yeah. uh, I saw him at a party and I was I would like shit my pants I was like oh my god there he is I can't not say something because well, you had seen him before you had seen him before like he was just the photographer and no, so no 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 oh. time i ever saw him he was the photographer it was new directors new films 2016 and um and yeah i knew of his work because um, we have another brother uh who, who was huge into punk and he put godless's photos up on his dorm wall nice. before <laughs> before he even came on our radar so i was like this is the guy who took pictures of alex chilton this is the guy who was there he took pictures of Johnny Thunders, but I was like freaking out. And um, he's, just, he like, I don't know, he could tell I was nervous. He's just like, chill out, man. They're just fucking pictures. <laughs> 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 and that's how he that. is. I mean, um, going back, I mean, I, Harith, Hari that's the word, right? That's definitely a word yeah. I got to teach him because that's exactly how he feels about CBGBs. It's just, you know, as great as it was, he, he, he in his mind, it is even more crazy and yeah and, it, and that, and new, york, just that new york is gone too it's not yeah. just cbgb's which is sad yeah that brings me to kind of one of the last thing i want you to touch on before we bounce out to somebody else which is um people who don't know you or don't follow you wouldn't know this but you guys did in my opinion arguably the coolest thing i've ever seen uh -oh. this film world premiered at the new york film festival uh, <laughs> which of course had no in-person screenings so can you tell everybody where you how you did the screening of this movie well um it was just an idea we had drunk on a roof one night and uh <laughs> it was it was you know sometimes you come up with an idea in that state that are just yeah, too good not to got, do yeah yeah and we felt we were like we have we have to do this um and so our idea was um cbgb's is no longer there but uh a uh, high highbrow fashion a store is there Leather goods and it's john vervada <laughs> Yeah, Barbados. As a, we want to do. Everyone a, knows what it is. We wanted I have a, no idea. What I wanted it is. a Voldemort. I wanted a Voldemort. It, you know, not not give it its name. But anyway, <laughs> yeah, same, same initial. The store that names unknown Barbados. or whatever. Uh, and we want we they have a beautiful roll gate that comes down at five p.m. whenever the workers decide to leave. Um, and our idea was to like just project it on like a huge white sheet and then invite all of our friends to CBGBs and then try not to get arrested. And then, <laughs> but, but uh, so it, it, we ended up going to Home Depot and we bought a, uh, we rented a generator. It turned into a whole thing. Like the idea just kept growing and growing. We made little flyers for it. We got like the biggest speaker that you could buy, like the really, like the most loud one. And then yeah. I mean, it's an only eight minute film, so it was kind of a nice, it was like we didn't, there was no chance of us getting arrested, but, but we, we tacked up a sheet on the grate and then we had like 40 people come, 40 people came and yeah, 40 of our closest friends and everyone was wearing masks and it was just like, we it swear. was, it was like a perfect uh, COVID experience. And yeah. also a fun fact is Godless kept looking around um at the big group of people ga gathered on the bowery at night and he said this is exactly what cbgb's used yeah. to be like Between one one because there's a lot of ki cool kids hanging out outside and then two 
the city was shut down because of COVID. Yeah. And so all around was there was nothing like the c- city yeah, was like, dead and that's what yeah, it was leaker and bowery yeah. right yeah. that's what it was in the 70s and well so, that's as that's as punk rock as you can get so i'm gonna give you guys mad props for that yeah a tear a tear fell from his eye and yeah. it went into his mask <laughs> right. uh, well i'm gonna turn it back over to charles and tag and they can pose more questions out to the team so. <laughs> i want to ask emily a question if i can emily uh, and i i I'm dying to talk to you as a filmmaker, but the subject matter of your film was so fascinating. And so I would say of the moment, but this is a moment that's existed for a hundred years plus now. Has anything changed in your hometown since, um, I don't know, January 6th? Um, No, not really. Uh, um, I mean, the flag's still there, the monument's still there. Um, the community group that organized uh, to try and get the statue down, that was immediately um, paused in court because um, the Confederate, uh, you know, people that believe in keeping them up are, are pretty creative and um, not giving in anytime soon. So um, there's a, you know, a legal filing, but it hasn't moved forward at all. But it's, it's interesting to me too, because as I was saying, you had to enter this project not knowing how it was going to end. And, and as you're pointing out now, it really hasn't. But I mean, so there had to be, you had to, as a filmmaker, see the potential for this to go, you know, like a spice navigator in June, any of a dozen different ways, a thousand different ways. Mm-hmm. To what extent did you feel that you weren't, I know, guiding the, the, the happenings, but guiding the story to receive it most interestingly? How did you do that? How do you do that? Um, yeah, so I started this in 2017. Um, so I guess arguably before the moment we're in now on this yeah. issue. Um, and it was largely because, um, you know, it's my hometown. And I thought, wow, this is crazy. Like there's an ice cream shop that's fighting to try and get a Confederate flag down. Like it's ridiculous. Um, and it's not a Ben and Jerry's. No, <laughs> not at all. Um, and so- That would be a bad look. Yeah, it would be, that's true. Um, and so for me, I guess I, I, had been, I came, was coming off of a film, um, also about race in the South and really wanted to make something that didn't just preach to the choir because I think, um, you know, especially after the 2016 election, we were aware of all the bubbles we build around ourselves and the echo chambers we exist in. Um, And so I really wanted to try and make something that would actually say something new in some way, shape or form um, about the issue and try and actually spark conversation um, that is not just people showing up to something that they already agree with. Um, And so I guess that would be where I feel like my role came in as the filmmaker is I really wanted, um, you know, with including the Sons of Confederate Veterans, for example, like I could have very much made this film with just the ice cream shop. Um, Mm -hmm. But I thought, you know, who the hell knows if they'll say yes, they, you know, I just sent a random email and two days later, somebody called me from an unlisted number and you never know who it's going to be. Yeah. Um, and they ended up being willing to talk. Um, and so as the filmmaker, I just really wanted to, you know, foster conversation with anybody that would be willing to speak. I, th- I grew up in Charlotte. And so I'm familiar with Orangeburg, you know, vaguely from like, basketball tournaments and stuff and the thing about your movie that like really spoke to me was you you captured this like inevitability of the conflicts between the the two sides in a way that like I haven't seen I haven't seen people that have like lived with it that way I haven't really seen that committed to film and like in the best possible sense like it's it's about the conversation as much as it's about changing anything before you can get there, you have to get to the point where you can talk to each other. And I thought that was, mm-hmm. that was, that was such a like profound statement. Like it's a, it's a simple thing, but like it costs people so much just to have that conversation. And I thought your movie did like a brilliant job of capturing the importance of that. Yeah. I think that's a good lead in to Ben actually uh, with Concerto. Um, and one of the things that I'm kind of really curious about is obviously this is a movie that's very close to Chris. Um, and so I guess I want to know about you, 
when you boarded the project, if you were there from the beginning, or if you look, you found all of this and you were the one that got the ball rolling, but also about dealing with kind of this really tough subject matter of your subjects, you know, move from Florida across Jim Crow South, you know, to get all the way out to, you know, West Coast. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it actually, so Chris and I have been friends for a number of years. Um, never had collaborated together. And we were working on a project with LA Phil about just uh, just broadly, they wanted to support a film that was at the intersection of music in LA. Mm -hmm. And I was like flipping through the program at the Walt, for the Walt Disney concert, and I saw Chris was gonna mm -hmm. prepare an original concerto in February. And I called him and I was like, oh, you know, can I make a behind the scenes film of you writing this okay. concerto? And, um, and he was like, yeah, let's come on over. Like, let's, let's sit and talk about it. And when I went over there, he was wearing a suit and it was like Tuesday morning. And I was like, did I miss <laughs> something? Like, how, why are you all dressed up? It was like nine o'clock in the morning. And he was like, oh, I just came from a dedication ceremony for my 91 year old grandfather in South LA. They named the entire block after him. Oh, sweet. And I think like anybody would, I said, well, how, why? What, yeah, why? Yeah. And Chris, just launched into this amazing narrative of how his grandfather at 17 kind of picked up and hitchhiked across the country and, you know, from to Detroit it was, you know, it snowed there, so he didn't stop there. And, you know, somehow Los Angeles was gleaming to him as the place where he wanted to be. And then, you know, the, the line in the film of, of that, you know, racism was and is everywhere, but they, they, his line of, you know, in the, in the South, they tell you in Los Angeles, they show you, um, <laughs> and how, how he had to, you know, be pretty ingenious to, to build a life for himself in Los Angeles. So as soon as Chris told me the story, I was just like, that's, that's a much more interesting <laughs> than I had planned, which is like, can Chris write the concerto? <laughs> um, <laughs> the big day so so we kind of uh locked eyes and thought you know i wonder if we could make a film that kind of like follows the concerto um and also tells this story, tells the story. and i asked the stupid question like i'm not I, i'm not a classical music aficionado so i was like what what well, what is a concerto in the first place and he said on that morning he said a concerto is a conversation between the uh -huh. soloist and the rest of the orchestra <laughs> and i just thought that, that would be a great sort of spine for the film is Chris and his grandfather having this discussion. I'd always wanted to do the double interatron um, technique of people looking directly at each other and the project was born from there. Awesome. Um, I don't know if Charles, Tag, have anything to add to that. Otherwise we can open up everybody to sort of like have it with each other. Charles, you do? Ben, yeah, real, real quick. Um, but the thing about when I rewatched the movie was you found this um, this balance between Chris's story now and his grandfather's story, and it, it it reinforces itself. Like obviously, like that's the whole point of the thing. But how did you? How long did it take you to find that 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 like equilibrium where you weren't leaning too much into the past? You also weren't too much of the. It it seemed like such a such a delicate thing, but it was it was awesome. Yeah, it I. I it took a long time, <laughs> yeah. um, especially in that we wanted to make it, we, we knew we were gonna distribute it with the New York Times. So we knew it was yeah. gonna be online and that was like its yeah. primary spot. Um, so we didn't wanna make it too long because we wanted to make sure lots of people could see it. And, but we have like seven different layers of things happening. So it was long. Our editor, Lucas Dong, deserves so much credit um, as I'm sure all of the people that edited, maybe some of you edited your own films, but um, you know he deserves a lot of credit because there was a lot, I think this film went through 30 different iterations. Yeah. Um, and it was all happening during the pandemic. So it was just like a lot of uh, just rubbing our heads and, and wondering if we're making it worse or better in the like depths of <laughs> the summer. Yeah. Um, but, you know, somehow it came out on the other side. I mean, it's funny, like a lot of the, now looking back at it, the moments that I like, oh, that really works, were things that we added back in at the last minute. We're like, oh, I kind of miss that moment where like it cuts from the foot pedal of the ironing board to the foot pedal of the piano. And we like put those things back in at the last minute. And I'm so glad we did. But it was, 
like every documentary, is sort of a process that took three times as long as you thought. Yeah, yeah it's um, it's absolutely, it's beautifully edited yeah. and composed. I'm mean, composed. It's not a pun. Um, but the way the whole thing flows and is put together, and the you know the points of view, it, it's a remarkable film. It certainly blew me away and uh, and all of us. And you should know, actually, um, Enzian right now is playing Oscar shorts in the theater and virtually. So even prior to the festival opening tomorrow, uh, people have had a chance to see this yeah. already on the big screen and at home. And um, obviously they've been able to see it at home from New York Times Opdocs too. But yeah. um, this film deserves every accolade yeah. and award it wins. This is remarkable. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah, and, and we're hoping, you know, it's, it's Chris's grandfather's 92, and that's the best part of the whole thing. Like, Chris and I are obviously thrilled, but, like, yeah. Horace Bowers was not expecting this kind of, like, yeah. <laughs> in his 92nd year. I mean, it is just such a thrill to see him do all these interviews and react to it, and, and the story that he really experienced in silence 70 years ago, all the sacrifice that he made, now being celebrated and on a billboard and you know I, uh, I that's the that's the most exciting part of the whole thing for us and so hey, appreciate well, it. we'll get ready to open this up to the team but i will say just um one of the things we say every year when we program six times real and our marketing is that these are the films we always think everybody should be keeping an eye out for come academy awards time um unfortunately we write all of that material and <laughs> <laughs> pick all these movies way before they're nominated for the academy awards but we wish you obviously all the best and since nobody here is competing against you i imagine they all wish you the best as well <laughs> um, and uh yeah that would be really funny if somebody said no right now it would be like straight <laughs> up like own it that it belongs to me <laughs> so you guys can want to bum rush the oscars later uh but i'd love to you know like we have when time Time for you know maybe ten minutes of anybody who wants to ask anybody else questions about your projects uh, to go for it. So yeah, um, Alex, uh, I just wanted to ask Emily a question uh, about that interview when you ask sort of your main subject, who's a son of the Confederate flag, and then you have it playing underneath the battle. I felt like it was a very powerful moment, and I was wondering if you could tell me more. What else? Are they, uh, what else are they holding on to in the South in terms of like this notion of heritage? Uh, I'm from New York, I'm living in Maine. Um, besides all the horrible things, like it's just crazy to me that he was reading the document and then he, he doesn't, you know, he can't put two and two together. Sure. Um, well, I mean, throughout American history, we have a uh, long le legacy of brainwashing. Um, and so, you know, the lost cause is like the ultimate example of that, uh, where, you know, right after the Civil War, there's been, you know, centuries long brainwashing of Southern whites um, who have Confederate ancestors. And I think it's just, you know, it's so ingrained when it's something that, you know, your grandfather and their father and their father before them um, has told you, you, it just doesn't compute. Um, and so I think that, you know, I had no idea how he was going to respond to that, but um, somebody, a, a friend who's also a filmmaker encouraged me that, you know, you have this opportunity, you have to like ask, you have to show him in black and white, this is what this says, how can you justify this? Um, and he can't, I mean, you see that, he literally yeah. cannot, um, but it's his whole being. And so for him to deny that I think would mean probably some sort of personal like meltdown, which, you know, that, that's the title. Um, and yeah, it's this major, major contradiction that I feel like if you're a Southerner and a white Southerner, it's, it's really, yeah, it's not explainable. It doesn't make any sense on paper at all. Yeah. Being, you know, in, the South, like I could at least tell you, Alex, that cognitive dissonance is is you you're born with it here. <laughs> like it's just like it does it. Yeah, it's that scene as sad as it is didn't even register as a surprise. Like, like is the can, do they still have the um, Confederate cemetery right off of the highway in Orangeburg? 
Um, probably. I mean, there's so many little Confederate. I think we did a day where Buzz just took us around to, I think we went to six or seven or um, my producer, Seth, uh, who's going to be there in person, uh, went to like yeah. six or seven in Orangeburg. They're all over the place. Yeah. I live in North Georgia and grew up in Central Florida. So I've seen much of the same thing. And it's, it's really a logic tight compartment. There is no penetrating yeah. it. I mean, there's the potential for people to convert and see the light and things like that, but there's it's generationally reinforced. And it's, I think in many ways, it always struck me as a way for them to cope with what they recognize inside is a, a horrible responsibility. Deny it. Hmm. All right, we have time for another question or two. I do, I before, I, I, before I ask the next question, I just want to say, um, you know, thank you guys for making these movies uh, last year. It was, for me watching this stuff, it was really helpful to like get through the craziness of being in like locked in my house for a year and a half. Uh, so uh, honestly, like, I, I don't know what I would have done without getting to see about a turtle um, in his <laughs> basement or, uh, you know, Confederate monument in South Carolina. Um, so I uh, thank you. Um, I think it's a lot of a lot this. of. So go ahead. I was going to say it's fun to see all the. It's this is such non-essential work, but it is holding a, a slice of, of some sort of essential piece to um what we have to go through. Yeah. Is just make films either about important things or just make films that make people happy. You know. So. And imagine this documentary filmmakers that gave you guys time to edit. And as programmers, we were like, thank God, there's nothing else to do. I guess we'll watch movies. <laughs> <laughs> But that was my feeling watching films as I was watching films that had been edited a lot since nobody could get out of their house to, to shoot. And I, I wondered once or twice were some of these, and I don't know if that's the case with you, but, but with some, the broader, we watched hundreds of films, but if there was maybe possibly a, a second, some of these were like second string projects that moved forward and became first string masterpieces because people had time to dig into them and work them and mold them and cut them and recut them and things. And it was, well, you know, just amazing stuff. I'm not saying that's, I'm sure all of your films were first string, but it was, it was no, amazing. Was... I'd watch a film and I'd go, and I've never seen such an edited film in my life. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I don't know if anybody to jump in on that we one. Had... <laughs> <laughs> what? Did you hear us? No, yeah, what's up? Uh, <laughs> wait. Internet connection is unstable. No, I think we're. <laughs> <laughs> I, think um, well, I was. Plane is coming in and going to hit you. <laughs> um, <laughs> no, um, we had about sixteen hours of um, audio with David, and we had started interviewing about five months before the pandemic, and uh, we had like three interview sessions in the can, and we started assembling the movie right as soon as we started getting like free time and like we like for some reason it worked we yeah we lost all of our we know we didn't get any jobs and we we're like this is awesome we can start working on a project that we don't have, we're not getting paid for and then the pandemic hit and we're like well fuck now we don't have a job so we may as well work on this more um and try not to be depressed about it and and then um i think also the film was um was like fully realized in the pandemic style because um, we we shot everything in our apartment and we printed everything off with one printer and we just and every set was about this big but we just had a <laughs> had a camera that looked oh made it look um, good. one fun talking point is the decision to have godless with the mask or not a mask at the very end there's the snapshot of standing in front of CBGB's at the very end of the film and. He was okay. He was like, you want one without the mask? And we got a few without the mask because there's no one around. But anyway, uh, then we were faced with the decision of like, which ones should we use? And we figured it was so similar. The basically the click over from 19 or excuse me, from 2019 into 2020 was exact, like very similar to the click over from 1979 to 1980 that David yeah. Godless um, highlights in the film. And so uh, we just, thought it was a cool visual motif to show like oh wow we're in another one of those times where it's just like god remember 
how sick how, it was yeah, a couple years like ago. How good we had it in 2019. Yeah. And it's not like, a, yeah, we didn't want to make like a COVID film, but it kind of yeah. turned out to be one. Awesome. Well, I want to thank everybody for joining us as well, um, taking times out of your lives. Louie and Noah will be at the festival. Um, Seth, the producer of Meltdown and Dixie, is going to be here as well. So if you uh, love these films online, you want to get a chance to see them in the theater, by all means, come out and take a look at them. Otherwise, don't we'll, forget we'll to be at the bar. We'll, we'll be, be at the, at bar, the bar outside. <laughs> Currently at the bar. So, yeah. Um, yeah, don't forget to vote for your favorites. I really appreciate you guys joining us, and we'll see you on the next one.